Well, we're going to go ahead. I say we go ahead and get started. And Jennifer, if anybody comes in, just admit them as we keep going. Um, originally, this session for Lit Academy quarterly updates were just supposed to be office hours. Um, but after our first session, um, we had some questions come up around tier two interventions. And so we wanted to address those for you guys as best possible. So we're going to talk briefly about that. We have a little presentation this morning about tier two interventions and what that looks like, especially in the older grades. Um, and that's where we tend to get bogged down into what do we do and how do we get there. So we're going to go through that and I'm going to apologize ahead of time. I'm a little under the weather. So if I sound a little froggy or if I, you see me drinking some water, I am, you know, getting through. So my apologies, but we're going to make it today. And we're so glad that you're on the call with us um, this morning. And please feel free to unmute and ask any questions as we keep going. Um, for those of you on the call, I'm Jennifer Armand. I'm the Client Success Specialist for the Center, and I deliver all of the Lit Academies across the state. Um, and so I am glad to be here with you guys this morning um, to give you this information. My partners in crime, Miss Alicia and Miss Andrea, are both in schools today, but I have Courtney and Jennifer Kelly here with me from the Center um, as part of our team, and they are able to answer any questions as well. So thank you guys for all jumping on with us this morning, and we're going to start rolling. So we, again, we're going to talk about Tier 2 interventions, and so our session objectives today are to understand exactly what is that and what it looks like, to analyze that connection between Tier 2 interventions and the simple view of reading, right? We've got the decoding part, we've got the comprehension part, and what all does that mean? How does it fit together? And then we're going to explore some activities that are appropriate for Tier 2 interventions. And I feel like that's usually where we get bogged down. I know they need them, but what exactly do I do? And we don't just want to pull things, right? We want to make sure that we are doing all of the work that's embedded around the science of reading, but also embedded around our data and making sure that we are pinpointing exactly what our students need during this intervention time. So what is it? Tier two intervention is provided for students who have fallen below that benchmark and are at some risk of academic failure. And if you notice, there's a box around right in the middle. It says driven by assessment data. It is so, so important that we remember that we are grouping our students in tier two intervention by our data. We are not just guessing what they need, but we have concrete information that is telling us that our students are lacking background knowledge, or they are lacking in vocabulary skills, or they are lacking in phonemic awareness, and so that we know that that is exactly what targeted intervention they need dur during tier two. We also know that this is administered through small group instruction. Tier two intervention cannot be done whole group. It is done in small group settings and you can have these rotating throughout your classroom and they're grouped based upon need and same need. And then we also know that tier two intervention provides additional skills and practice of those grade level skills. So when you're giving that grade level instruction, when we've gone through our tier one curriculum, when we realize that they are still missing some of those skills, this is a time when we can catch some of those during our academic time in the classroom. So right here, we have that simple view of reading on the screen. And if you look at it, you see that you've got, if we, were, we remember, if we go back to Lit Academy, we talked about printed word recognition, right? That, and then we have language comprehension. This was our math problem we had, right? One times zero is going to equal zero every time, or zero times one equals zero. If you are missing one component, we know that it makes it extremely difficult for you to be able to gain meaning and have a true understanding of what you are reading, right? We need them to be able to comprehend. That's the ultimate goal when we're reading. But if you're missing, we have those students that can read it, right? They're fluent, but then when you ask them any questions, they can't answer them, right? Or you have the opposite, they're not fluent readers and therefore it impedes their comprehension. So it's that one times zero again. If you notice underneath here, 
we've added a couple extra boxes for you today. And if we're thinking about word, printed word recognition, we're talking about phonemic awareness and phonics, right? These is that This is that basic understanding um, of letters and sounds and pushing them together. And then on language comprehension, we have the fluency, vocabulary, and then ultimately it equals comprehension. And if we're missing any of those pieces, we're missing our overall goal. Here is where we're talking about Scarborough's reading rope. And if you notice, I have a box around language comprehension because this is truly that meat, especially in our upper grades, grades three through you know, 12, when we're trying to get to background knowledge, vocabulary, those language structures, verbal reasoning and literacy knowledge, those print concepts. We're gonna talk about some activities that we can do to address some of those needs during tier two um, intervention today, but I want you to really stop and think about it. The progression of the skills that impact tier two intervention, think about the data and where they're scoring their lowest and how is that impacting your tier two intervention? Are you using that data to make your groups or are you just guessing as to what they might need? We know that we have to have the language comprehension and the word recognition, and all of those have to wrap together in order to get a skilled reader. But how just do we identify those students that are struggling? And what do we do once we know it? What activities can we use? So that's what we're going to talk about in these next couple of slides. Background knowledge, we all know that if our students do not have information to hook onto, to make some connections to, that they're not going to be able to have a true understanding or comprehension around a text that they're reading. So think about it this way. Um, in that small group intervention time, you have that opportunity to kind of build on that background knowledge. You can have them do a web quest. You can have them take virtual field trips on the computers, and it doesn't necessarily have to be guided by you. This is something that students, especially older students, can do independently, right? They can go through and work through, and, and we just put some graphics up here of different places that you can go in order to do that. Um, but pre-teaching some of those concepts before you get to the units, when we're thinking about um, the guidebook lessons and things like that, we know that if we can give them some background knowledge, then I'm thinking specifically the person that comes to mind is Call of the Wild for our eighth graders in guidebook lessons in Louisiana. We really have zero true understanding of what an Iditarod race is or of that amount of snow and sleds and bobsled. Like that's just, you know, Greek to us, basically. And so what we do have to do is that we have to be able, we could give them at that moment time to really experience some of that, watching videos and things like that so that they can have some of that working knowledge that can paint that picture in their mind before that unit actually even begins. So when you start talking about that unit with your students, they have something that they can connect it to and link on to. Um, there are so many different uh, virtual field trips and web quests out there that you can actually find based upon your topics. You just have to spend some time and, and search for them, but it's a great way during those tier two interventions to let your kids have some time to be able to experience those. We also talk about, I know during Lit Academy, we've said many, many times that if we're going to hang our hat anywhere, we're going to hang it on background knowledge and vocabulary because we know we can do some work, some real work around those, those skills. Um, vocabulary intervention, we can base it around morphology, homophones, and words in context, and all of those things you can have activities to do. The next slide actually shows, I believe, yes, here we go. So during this so on the guidebook slides, a lot of times you're going to see a um, section like this that's going to be popped up and it's going to have a word that's underlined and it's going to ask the students, you're going to, the teachers are supposed to ask them, what do we feel about this word? Like, what do we know about this word? How do we get through this nerd? 
were get through this word. Sorry, there goes my there goes my words trembling. Um, but if you read the passage, it says an hour passed. He picked up the headset and tried again. It was he knew in the end all he had, but there was no answer. He felt like a prisoner kept in a small cell that was hurling through the sky at what he thought to be about 160 miles an hour headed. He didn't know where, just headed somewhere until, and then we need to identify, okay, hurtling. What is that? What does that word mean? And a lot of times we hear our teachers say that, what does that word mean? However, we don't give them the skills that to look around it. So when we have things like a word map that's next to it, where the kids could actually take that word, write it in the middle, think about a definition. Y'all could create a definition on your own. Student-friendly, short, something that's palatable that the kids can remember, moving about wildly, and then synonyms, words that can mean the same. If somebody was moving around wildly, what does that mean? And then you would write down their responses and then they could draw a picture or they could copy and paste a picture from the internet. I tend to think that it's better that a student draws their own picture because it, it's that connection between the brain and the hand and putting it on paper. And then they actually use it in a meaningful center, uh, sentence. The meteor is hurling toward the earth. Something that is palatable, but you're actually teaching them how to use the information that's around them putting it in that map and you're having a discussion about that word. Word maps are awesome tools to use for our interventions. Once you also um, teach kids how to use word maps, they're able to use word maps in a more independent way. And so that they can have some word work time in a small group intervention station. Well, maybe while the teacher is working with students on something else, they could be actually doing word work independently or in group in a group setting where they're they're working together. As far as vocabulary interventions, vocabulary routines are it's really important that we explicitly teach that word. Um, and Anita Archer is the queen of vocabulary routines. And if you've not seen, um, I know we show a video of her during Lit Academy, but if you've not seen any of her videos, please go Google them. She is the ultimate. Um, but when you are teaching a vocabulary routine, it's very important that you teach that routine strategically, okay? It's important that the teacher pronounces that targeted word and asks questions about the linguistic structure of the word. They need to say the word and then they need to ask the students to repeat the word. Another thing that they can also do is to count the syllables in the word. So if we had the word hurtling, we would count those syllables. We'd have the students repeat it and we would say hurtling. Students, your turn, hurtling. What's the word? Hurtling. Again, hurtling. It's a repeat in nature. That repetition, we talk about all the time, systematic explicit instruction with repetition. The more they hear it, the more they use it. Okay, so then we're going to talk about explaining the meaning of that word in everyday language and discussing a part of the speech. When you were looking at that word map that we were just talking about, I said that that definition has to be very clear, concise, and student friendly. It doesn't need to be long. It doesn't need to be written out of the dictionary. It needs to be something that they can understand. If the student writes down a definition and they still don't understand the definition, what good is that definition to them? It has to be something that is palatable and easy for them to understand. Important information about direct instruction when it comes to vocabulary is that repeated exposure to that word, making sure that they take ownership of those vocabulary words when they're speaking and writing, that's the ultimate purpose of vocabulary instruction, right? We want to add that to their bank so that they can pull it up at a time when they're working independently. And they, we need multiple opportunities to be able to use those words in conversation as well. Teachers also need to be able to provide gestures and examples from the context and other situations bringing it to life, giving them a real life example is something that they can make a connection to. Um, asking students, for examples, because they may actually have some good information to give you. Um, and then another thing that students need to be able to do is to say, spell, and write the word, right? Syllables and morphemes are counted and they repeat the word to themselves and write it in their notebooks. 
It's a quick routine. It provides the student lots of repetition. It provides them a speaking moment. It provides them a writing moment. It provides them a talking moment. And those are all important when it comes to the redelivery of vocabulary instruction. Saying it, speaking it, writing it, thinking about when we get back, when we we're talking about our, go back to that slide, Jennifer, when we we're talking about, um, if you think about uh, phoneme graphing mapping, when we're learning how to blend and segment words, right? Very similar when it comes to this vocabulary instruction. They're saying the word, they're spelling the word, they're writing the word, they're talking about the syllables and the morphemes, and they're counting them at the same time. Plus they're talking about the definition of the word. And if a student has been doing that from the early grades, once they get into this with vocabulary instruction, it just ties it all together. This uh, vocabulary intervention is an annotation strategy, and we talk about annotating in our notes all the time, right? We ask our teachers to annotate their lesson plans. We also ask them to annotate their notes, and we ask our students to do the same thing. So what do our students do when they come across a word that they do not know? It's important for us to teach them what to do, to actually model that, that I do, we do, you do strategy with our kids is extremely important here when it comes to vocabulary intervention. So the first thing we want to do is if we're reading a passage in our curriculum and we come across the word, we want to underline that unknown word. And then we also want to teach our kids that, you know what, it might be okay to have more than one word that we don't know in this passage. And my words may be different than Courtney's words or maybe different than Shana's words or Jennifer's words or Michael's words. It's important that we make sure that it's okay our kids have different words because everybody's word bank is different, right? We think about our sight word bank, same thing with our vocabulary word bank. All of these are different for our kids, but we want to underline this term that we have. So in this particular passage, I think Jennifer, if you click, it's going to underline a word for me. Aha. Uh -huh. So there's the word. They came across many obstacles while trying to find the tomb. You want the students to reread that sentence with the unknown word and look for clues in that sentence to try to figure out the meaning. Rereading it is extremely important. Again, that gives them that repetition. So as the teacher in the classroom, we would take this passage and we would have read the whole thing out loud and then we're going to reread this. All right. They came across many obstacles while trying to find the tomb. Hmm, what do I think that that means? And if you look at step three, it says, you know what, it may not be that we can find meaning from just that one sentence. We may actually have to find meaning around the sentences of that unknown word. So we're going to reread the sentences surrounding the sentence with the unknown word and look for clues to try to figure out the word's meaning. So going back again and say, okay, Many archaeologists searched for the tomb, but Carter and his team were the first to find it. They came across many obstacles while trying to find the tomb. One was that the daily temperature reached as high as 120 degrees. Another was that the tomb is in the desert where nothing grows and there's nothing to protect people from the extremely hot sun. To make things worse, there was a lot of sand and rock around the tomb that were difficult to remove because the sun made them very hot to touch. So all of those things seem like to be different problems that this person is having, right? So obstacles, another word for obstacles could be problems. And that is a simple definition, easy. And then you can have the, the students identify what were the problems? What were those obstacles that, are, that they were facing in when they were finding King Tut's tomb? And then we can start to talk. This is like, could be very overwhelming. So don't forget on this slide, I promise. All this color coding and circles and lines. The first time you look at it, you might go, oh, what does that mean? But really this is talking about sentence parsing. And this is where we actually break apart the language, language structures within um, our sentences. So in this slide, they have coded the cohesive ties and the divided sentences into and divided the sentences into meaningful phrases in order to analyze those sentences. So really what they're doing is they're teaching the students strategies that will help them 
with these denser, complex sentences, right? We know that many of our students do not have the knowledge to understand complex sentences like this. And so teachers have to be aware of the roadblock and how this makes it difficult to gain that meaning of the text and how to plan for it. So in this particular slide, you can see where the teacher has read through this section and she's broken down the sentence into parts, right? The word here is divorce. And it says it was an ugly word, he thought, a tearing, ugly word that meant fights and yelling. So what was the tearing, ugly word? Like, that's what you're asking the students. And then as you continue to read how he hated lawyers who sat with their comfortable smiles. Lawyers, God, he thought, meant like, what does that actually mean? And how he is frustrated with the lawyers, right? He tried to explain to him in legal terms and how all that he lived in was coming apart and breaking and shattering all of the solid things. His home life, all the solid things, divorce, a breaking word, an ugly breaking word. And then you can ask these questions. Why is, why is Brian frustrated with his lawyers? Like, what are they talking about? And what is breaking and shattering all of these solid things? So it's really teaching the kids to, to, to highlight and circle through and underline the parts of this that are giving us meaning. How do we break the sentence apart? That's a lot to, to, uh, to be able to comprehend and understand a lot of language right? A lot of words and it can get muddled, but really what they're explaining is divorce and how this person is feeling during this time and how the lawyers are making him feel. So it's really kind of breaking it apart for the students and getting them to dig deep, um, to underline their feelings and being able to break it apart effectively. When you're doing that, what you're wanting them to be able to do is to restate this complex structure in a simple way, right? Really, what is this author trying to tell us? What is he saying with all of this flowery language that can be overwhelming for our kids? And so what you want to do is take all of this information and have your students help you. Again, I do, we do, you do about how this sentence can be rewritten. Really, basically, what you're saying here is that Brian was upset, right? He was upset about his home, his life. He felt like it was breaking apart because of this divorce, and he disliked the way the lawyers were trying to make it seem like everything was okay and normal, when in reality, he felt like his world was shattering. So really taking all of that flowery language and putting it into terms that our kids can understand. Again, making it palatable for them to comprehend. Ultimately, it's about comprehension. One other way that you can do this, Jennifer, I don't know if you noticed, but I moved the slide. <laughs> it are just statements, and that's part of, um, in our guidebook lessons, and part of uh, the writing revolution is just statements. How do we get what is the most important part of this? And why is it important for us to write our gist statement? So I feel like it's really important. It's really simple. Three steps. It encourages students to monitor their comprehension while they're reading. It also helps students to integrate important information across sections of the test. And it helps students remember the most important information that they read, right? A lot of times when you're reading complex text, there's actually information in there that you really don't need. It's there to help build around, but it's not the most important part. And really what we want our kids to be able to do is to pull out the important pieces, right? And if you look over here on the side on this little purple cue card, it says step one, who or what is this section about? That's what are we talking about? Who are we talking about? What is the most important information about the who or what? And then writing your just statement by combining one and two together, right? And it says, remember, your just should include only the important information, leave out unnecessary details, and it should be a complete sentence. 
there is where we get bogged down. Sometimes we just put everything or they copy the whole thing, right? They copy all this and all the words, all the sentences around the word that they may not know because they don't know how to pull out that important information. So here it is, simple three steps on getting the gist. If you look at the next slide, here is a passage about um, and an annotating about Gandhi, okay? So if we were reading this, we would read this out loud as a class, the teacher would read it. We may do some choral reading. Um, I would not necessarily have the kids read it because some of this language may not be, um, may be very difficult for them to read. And we definitely don't wanna put anybody on the spot, right? Read it, choral cool, read it with them, with you. Repetition, right? Repetition, repetition, repetition. They need to hear it multiple times. Exposure is important. Over here on the side, you see the box, right? And it's going to break apart these sentences. We want to read this and we want to identify and mark the most important person, the who or the most important place or the most important thing, the what in this section of the text. So that's the first thing. As we read it, we want to identify what is this about? Who is this about? So if we were reading it, we would stop read it out loud, and then we would go to this. All right, class, tell me, what is this? Who is this about? Who are we reading about today? Hopefully they would be able to tell you that they were reading about Gandhi. And then it says that you're supposed to mark and list the important information about the most important person, place, or thing in this text. So as you're reading it, you would say that Muhammad Gandhi was born October 2nd of 1869 in India. He went to college in London, England to become a lawyer. Gandhi was dismayed with the way England treated the people of India. He believed that the government of England could be persuaded to change without violent or force. For example, when England taxed Indian salt in 1930, Gandhi and thousands of Indians walked more than 100 miles to the sea to make their own salt so they wouldn't have to pay the taxes on salt if they bought it in the market. When Gandhi reached the sea, he was arrested. Gandhi spent years of his life in jail because he wanted to be a good role model for his country's people. Whenever he heard his followers were acting violently, he stopped eating. When he stopped eating, some people paid, paid attending and stopped acting violently. So as you read this, and as I would have read it as loud as the teacher of the classroom, and then had my kids read it with me again, so that again, we get a multiple exposure. We want them to say, okay, who is this about? Somebody tell me who is this information about? Hopefully they're going to tell you it's about Gandhi, right? And then we're going to talk about what was the most important part? What's that most important information? And then we want them to be able to point out that Gandhi was upset that people of India were being treated well by the people of England and he, that he believed that they needed changes that could happen without violence or force. It was very important that didn't need violence in order to, for change to happen. And another thing that to me that was important was that Gandhi spent time in jail for doing what he felt was right and that he stopped eating whenever he heard about the violence. What we also want the kids to understand too is that there's information here that really is not that important. And we want to be able to kind of mark through that and get that out of the way, right? Is it important to know that he, his birth date and where he went to college and that he became a lawyer? Is that really what that passage is about? No. I mean, that's background information about him, but it's not what that passage is about. It's not the meaning of that passage. And we need to be able to teach our kids how to take that apart. I think about this a lot of times when doing the gist strategy, almost like a test taking strategy, right? When you're reading through your answers and you know you have some that are absolutely not it, right? You teach our kids how to mark through those answers. It's the same thing. Get them, get that information out of the way so that it's not um, impeding your comprehension of the text. And then what you want to do here is you can see where we've taken, here's a little simple note. I love that it's broken down so easy for our kids. Who or what is it about? They would write down Gandhi. What's the most important? He was upset at England's laws. He wanted to change them. He spent some time in jail. 
and fasting or starving. So he stopped eating, right? And most of the time, the kids may not know the word fasting. They're going to say he stopped eating because that's what it said in the text. And the gist is that Gandhi wanted to persuade England to change its laws by process, by protesting non-violently. Really important to understand that Gandhi here was not about violence and that was important. This little simple thing right here, this little note card, this little piece of paper where you just got step one and two written down and then they put it into a simple sentence. That's what that entire passage was about. Teaching our kids how to break that apart. Do I have any questions about that before we're, we're wrapping, we're kind of wrapping up and I've given you a lot of information, which is what this was about. But um, And the last thing we wanted to kind of point out is about verbal reasoning on interventions, right? Being able to provide some mini lessons, some additional practice um, around just simple passages or single sentences where you're trying to identify these literary elements such as tone and theme and point of view. We know that there are multiple points of view in some of the passages that we ask our students to read. I can think about a seventh grade passage um, when we're reading um, a Christmas Carol. There's different points of view that the story is being told from. There's different narrators. And so giving our um, students opportunities to be able to pull out those literary elements is really important. Also practicing similes and metaphors, because the more they practice, the more repetition, the more that they use it, the more that they're going to be able to put it into their writing when they're asked to do so on our test. So that's really important that, that we give them those exposures. We give them simple things that they can do during these tier two interventions, all based around their needs. Again, every bit of this is based upon the data that you're seeing in your classroom with your kids. We're not guessing what they need, but we are using our data to drive our instruction, to drive our tier two interventions, all while meeting the needs of those kids. Tier two interventions provide students with that additional practice and practice on grade level skills. And remembering, again, I just said it, it's all driven by their data. And then there's our contact information, of course, if you need us. Um, and we do want to make sure that we give you guys some time to ask some questions today. Um, it, and it doesn't necessarily have to be around what we just talked about. If there's anything that you guys have come up with um, that you have a question about or that you want um, to share with us that that you feel like you know you need some information about we'd be more than glad to to answer those for you today um, if you want to come off mute um, if you just want to share a story with us we'd love to to interact with you today and and have some information so I'm gonna mute myself for a second and give you guys a, a moment to to talk and and ask anything. Disclaimer, I've moved. I'm in a closet in the secretary's office. <laughs> so oh gosh, we've all been in a closet at least once. I got a little cold. <laughs> all right. Does anybody have any specific questions or are, um, hey, tell me something good. This has been a rough week. Tell me something great that's happening in your schools. <laughs> I know we have Grant Parish here. I see Ms. China. Um, Michael, are you from Grant as well? What parish? Yeah. Yes, I'm from Bird Elementary, Grant Parish. I uh, thought so. <laughs> well, we can we can see in our schools that we're moving more to data driven and being responsible with that data and and trying to make, you know, using that specific data like you talked about to to uh, respond with interventions and stuff. So we can see that, especially with Dibbles in the lower. Now we're still working in the upper. And I'm yeah. glad this was kind of more about the upper this morning because that's that's really what I needed. Good, I'm glad. And and truly that's where we see a, a great need as well. Um, our lower grades have Dibbles data that helps drive their instruction. But a lot of times in, in grades three and up, we get a, a situation to where we're like, okay, we know that they're fluent readers, but now what? Or, or just the opposite. So I'm, I'm glad this was helpful for you guys. And, and please feel free to reach out at any time, Michael, if you have any questions. Um, if your teachers feel like, you know, they need a little more guidance around some of these interventions, we're glad to, to assist in any way we can with you guys. 
And Michael's been participating in the district leader network um, work that we've been doing, and they have been really taking that back and applying that. So I'm really excited about that. So I, I do think that they've got some great things going there. And this was um, helpful to um, kind of clarify with the tier two and that that you know, looks different than tier three. And so um, I think that was helpful too. I think yesterday when they even talked about how you have to get this really sophisticated structure going to be able to move kids and it not, it doesn't necessarily have to land in one teacher's classroom, but you move through that. I think that's going to take some work. And so, um, but this was helpful. Good, good. good. All right, anybody else want to share us? We have a couple more people on here. If not, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> we do want to give you guys the opportunity to ask any questions or, or share any anything with us that you feel is pertinent to what's going so on. So probably in the in the literacy plans, that's probably a piece that we need to revisit is that tier two part for our, which are plans mainly for lower grades, but we, I mean, there's no reason for us not to look at a plan for three, grade five, but I know that we would need to look at those tier two, what, how does that look differently for those kids based on some of this information you gave today and what we learned yesterday, so. In March, um, our Q3 meeting, we'll talk a little bit more about what changes that need to, that we need to start looking at um, for those literacy plans. So it's good that you're starting a little bit early. You recognize that, hey, something else needs to be it was our best effort right then. So we know that we can fine tune those. And so um, we, we're, we're working on that. It's a living document, just like you change every day. So that document, I wouldn't change it every day, but that document needs to change as your students progress or as they, let's God forbid, don't progress as quickly as you expect them to. And then you're always learning something. So, you know, it, they need to be written in stand. So I'm so excited. We're anxious to um, complete this literacy. Um, we, we had hoped to be finished with the screener in December so that our January two professional development days we have would be about, you know, looking at that data and being able to form our groups and do those things. That's not going to happen more than likely. Uh, we have th uh, three schools that were chosen as field tests. Michael's school is one of them. So we're truly just trying to get that accomplished. And, you know, um, it's a, been a very pushback timeline. And so now yesterday we received information that the field test will be extended through January 19th. And so, I mean, we will have to do those and then we'll have to do our regular middle of the year screeners. So we're a tiny bit frustrated by that. <laughs> Yeah, you are not yeah. alone. I, I heard the same frustration <laughs> from, an, from another school district um, this last week when I was there and we were talking about timelines because typically they like to do their, their mid-year data points in December before the kids go home for, for oh. break so that we don't have any slump, you know, that slide and so that they can come back on those PD days and really dig into their data and make some decisions and things just True. like you're saying. So you are not alone in that. <laughs> they were one that was that was picked for a field test as well. So hopefully, Michael, you only have like one grade level that you have to do. <laughs> hey, Melanie. Well, well, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, we just had somebody join us and I was just welcoming her and telling her to jump in if she has a question. Um, we can field, field questions all day. All right. Well, I don't know. I have well, thank y'all very much. Thank you. you. Michael, I'm going to go. I have to get back in this other. <laughs> get out of the closet. <laughs> yeah, I've got an observation I'm fixing to go do. So. Okay. And I'm All coming right. to school after this in a little while. Okay. Appreciate you, ladies. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye, y'all.